I know, I know. I've been featuring some mainstream news here on my channel lately, but that's because most of my listeners and subscribers know not to take what they hear or see at face value, even for me. While many think the media is just for people who want to growl at their TVs at night before they go to bed or soak their dentures, if you apply scrutiny, you can often discern the elements of a cohesive agenda. I've said it before, individuals might benefit if they learned how to eat the proverbial meat and spit out the bones. A hallmark of an individual is the ability to discern information even through blemished mediums. Don't underestimate the unintended consequences of remaining uninformed. It seems it's getting close to impossible to even remotely cater the quixotic whims, baroque expectations, and melting cognitions people are openly assimilating. Snowflakes, hypersensitives, call them what you want. There are those who would rather seize the tempered embrace of complacency or fan the flames of ignorance than equip themselves with tools necessary to overcome aspects of the control grid. Networks of like-minded individuals, awareness, knowledge, preparation, the list goes on. These are the solutions I often offer up when asked, what can we do about the situation we're in? SHTF, without rule of law, it's knocking. We're asking for it. But the true source of preparation many will continue to reject is the full armor of God. Apart from God and without love, we aren't much of anything, and I want to share a couple of verses that highlights that. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Here's another. And although I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. These aren't just some bromide for the umbrage, but something much more to consider. But since we've prefaced, let's dive into the meat and potatoes here. What's up with the wireless strangeness? Some of you may remember the purported sonic weapons attack in Cuba, right? If not, or if you haven't, let's just go over that briefly. In the fall of 2016, a series of U.S. diplomats began suffering unexplained losses of hearing according to officials with knowledge of the investigation into the case. Several of the diplomats were recent arrivals at the embassy, which reopened in 2015 as part of former President Barack Obama's reestablishment of diplomatic relations with Cuba. Some of the diplomats' symptoms were so severe that they were forced to cancel their tours early and return to the United States, officials said. After months of investigation, U.S. officials concluded that the diplomats had been exposed to an advanced device that operated outside the range of audible sound and had been deployed either inside or outside their residence. It was not immediately clear if the device was a weapon used in a deliberate attack or had some other purpose. The U.S. officials weren't authorized to discuss the investigation publicly and spoke on condition of anonymity. So, Cuba, right? Well, now U.S. diplomats in China have experienced virtually the same thing. More U.S. citizens have been evacuated from China amid concerns that American government personnel and their families might be the target of sonic attacks by a rival country. U.S. State Department officials said on Wednesday it has sent a number of individuals from its consulate in Gonzo back to the U.S. for further evaluation and comprehensive assessment of their symptoms. Last month, a consulate worker in Gonzo was found to have suffered a mild traumatic brain injury after reporting abnormal sensations of sound and pressure from the late 2017 through April 2018. The department sent a team to Guanzo in late May to examine other U.S. staff and their family and investigate possible links between their symptoms and those of U.S. diplomats in Cuba last year, an incident that prompted U.S. to pull its staff from the country and expel Cuban diplomats from the U.S. The U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on Tuesday announced the formation of a task force to investigate unexplained health incidents among U.S. government personnel and their families overseas. The latest evacuation suggests what was previously described as an isolated case may turn into a wider diplomatic crisis at a time when U.S.-China ties are already at a low. Now, America can't or won't source these disturbances. Apparently, we're clueless. The investigators from the State Department's medical unit, FBI agents, and top-notch academic epidemiologists have all looked into the problem. The latest effort is the Health Incidents Response Task Force that the State Department announced this week. The task force includes interagency partners such as the Departments of Health and Human Services, Commerce, Justice, Defense and Energy, as well as other members of the Foreign Affairs Community State Department spokesperson Nicole Thomas told Popular Mechanics via email. So, all of these agencies, alphabet soups, and still the enigma. But diplomats aren't the only targets. KJ from The Scariest Movie Ever recently released a sort of news documentary, which is really just a series of clips illustrating a disturbing phenomenon. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the links to the individual stories, but I'll leave a link to KJ's film. We won't be playing the entire thing here. Bad form. Nicole, what happened? 
21 year old Nicole Natchman is not talking about the murders of her mother, Marion Dinas, or her stepfather, Robert Dinas. Both gunned down last Thursday night, but this arrest affidavit speaking volumes tonight. According to deputies, the FSU student began hearing voices on campus telling her to kill her parents. New details are emerging after a car plows into pedestrians in New York's famed Times Square. Police say the act appears to be deliberate. Two News reporter Kelly King has the developments and what they're learning about that suspect. Kelly? John, police say 26-year-old Richard Rojas said he was hearing voices and expected to die. Authorities say he was likely attempting suicide by cop. Rojas had been discharged from the Navy following disciplinary problems and had multiple prior arrests for driving while intoxicated. Rojas is accused of mowing down people in Times Square for three blocks before he was stopped by a row of steel barriers. Well, Lester, law enforcement officials say tonight that they do not consider this an act of terrorism. They say the suspect was struggling with serious mental health issues. Officials say Esteban Santiago was undergoing treatment for mental health problems, complaining that he was hearing voices. They say a few months ago, he walked into the FBI's office in Anchorage, complaining that the CIA was forcing him to join ISIS. Officials say local police were called, and he went voluntarily to a mental health facility for treatment. His aunt and uncle in Union City, New Jersey, near where officials say Santiago was born, say they believe he developed problems after a military deployment overseas. He's accused in a hostage scare that paralyzed downtown Pittsburgh. Now he says a crow told him to do it. We're learning more about what went on in the mind of Klein Faxon as police say that he held a businessman hostage for five hours. Channel 4 Action News reporter Bob Hazen was at his hearing just hours ago and joins us live. What are the new developments, Bob? Well, Klein Faxon stood just a few feet away from his victim. His lawyer says he never intended to hurt that victim, and we heard a bizarre new explanation for why he started this crisis. 22-year-old Klein Faxton believed he was hearing three voices inside his head the day he walked into this downtown office tower. One of them he calls the crow. The crow, he said, talked to him. Faxton's lawyer revealed that new detail to us this morning after a preliminary hearing in the case. Voices were telling him to, to cause some damage, cause some harm to someone. And he kept telling the voices, no, no, no. Faxton was arrested almost a month ago after police say he entered the office of Charles Breitzman on the 16th floor of Three Gateway Center and held Breitzman hostage at knife point. He was hearing two different voices. A lot of people don't know that. He was hearing two different voices uh, because he wasn't on his medication. And he was battling the voices. Driven by voices, that's the claim in an investigation by the Boston Globe about accused Boston Marathon bomber uh, Tamerlan Sarnayev. Brian Todd is joining us right now. Uh, Brian, the report suggests he was hearing voices, that right. he may have had a mental illness. What's going on? First indications of this, Wolf, from the Boston Globe's investigation that uh, he possibly did have some mental illness. The Globe uh, spoke to a doctor who was a family friend who had had conversations with a psychiatrist who had actually treated Tamerlan Sarnayev's parents. Uh, the doctor, who was a family friend speculated to the Globe that he thought that Tamerlan Tsarnaev might have had schizophrenia. The psychiatrist who treated his parents but did not treat Tamerlan Tsarnaev uh, told the Globe, or, or at least said at some point, that he believed that Tamerlan Tsarnaev uh, had some kind of paranoia. But the Globe is now reporting, quoting friends and others, as saying that Tamerlan Tsarnaev started hearing uh, a voice in his head as a young man and that it continued later on, that uh, one man who went to uh, mo the mosque with him quoted, uh, was quoted as saying, quote, he was torn between those two people. What Whatever was in his head and the persona that he was in real life. So, Outside the Alvarez family home, the crime scene tape has disappeared, along with any sign of the seven-year-old boy or his father. Their neighbors remain in a state of disbelief. Real shocking. I mean, I can't, I still can't get over it. I still can't get over it. Now that Maisa Alvarez has gone before a judge, her arrest report is public and sheds new light on her state of mind. The affidavit says Alvarez confessed that voices told her to kill her son. Police say that this woman is giving them several different reasons as to why and how she set this fire. Now, ultimately, investigators believe she set the fire, left, came back to the scene three hours later and was visibly upset, and that's when they took her in for questioning. Pittsburgh police say 42-year-old Latoya Lyerly intentionally set fire to this house in Homewood, which was being used as a boarding house. 
Lyerly tells police she's been living on the first floor for three weeks, but she doesn't have any money, so she cooked and cleaned for the owner. She says she was working for the owner Tuesday night when they got into an argument about her radio being too loud, telling police the argument became heated, and she said she was going to burn the expletive house down. By 6.20 the next morning, fire alarms went off at the neighboring home. It was a hard fight. Crews worked to keep the fire from spreading, but once inside, they found two men dead on the second floor, a third man deceased on the top floor. Police identify the victims as 56-year-old Calvin Turner, 68-year-old Gerald Johnson, and Darlin Vance, whose age has not yet been released. Neighbors say the owner here offered several long-term boarding rooms to those in need. She was helping homeless people. Yeah, it's cold out here. And Lyerly was one of those people. In an interview with investigators, she first denied setting the fire and then said it was accidental. But when asked again, she said the house was, quote, filled with demons. And she began hearing voices telling her to carry out her mission. She admitted to lighting paper coffee strainers on fire, setting them on furniture, and then locking the door and walking away. Big story there. Also a big story coming out of the South today. We're getting some new information on a deadly standoff in Louisiana. Police say a 20-year-old suspect took three bank employees hostage yesterday. He released one, but after more than 12 hours, he shot the other two, killing one and leaving the other in critical condition. That's when police moved in and they killed him. Now we're learning more about the suspect. Police say he suffered from paranoid schizophrenia and believe something had been implanted in his head. Newport police tell us they came here to the Marriott a month ago for a harassment call. According to the police report, the man we now know is the Navy Yard shooter said people were following him. He was hearing voices and they were putting vibrations in his body to keep him awake. Newport police say they responded to the Marriott Hotel early in the morning on August 7th. Aaron Alexis told police he was a naval contractor who traveled often. Alexis told the officer he had a verbal fight with someone at the airport in Virginia as he was getting on a flight to Rhode Island. And that person sent three people to follow him and keep him awake by talking to him and sending vibrations into his body. Alexis left a Middletown hotel, went to a Navy base hotel, but still heard the voices. He escaped to a third hotel, the Marriott but the voices continued. Alexis told the officer the three individuals were speaking to him through the floor and using some sort of microwave machine to send vibrations through the ceiling, penetrating his body so he cannot fall asleep. Look at these pictures here. Scroll down a little bit. There's a bigger picture further down. It's a uh, diagram, and it starts talking about electromagnetic effects on the human body. And it talks about psychoelectric weapons. Yeah, we've got, I mean, openly... Barack Obama spent $200 million on his brain project with DARPA. Yeah, let's see if we can hack into people's brains. Let's see if we can take away memories or implant false memories. And let's see if we can do it wirelessly. That's their big push right now. They don't want to have to, you know, take you in and jack into the back of your neck like the Matrix or stick a, do an operation and stick a probe into your head. No, they want to be able to do it remotely, wirelessly, without your perception. And so when you look at this diagram, they've got a human body there. And here's some of the creepy things they've got pointing at it. Uh, one of them, forced memory blanking and induced erroneous actions. Another one, forced manipulation of airways, including externally controlled forced speech. They can make you say stuff that you don't want to say. Forced nudging of arm during delicate or messy work, causing injury or spills. Forced precision manipulation of hands, sometimes synced to the forced walking visions. To give you microwave hearing. Huh. I guess so you can hear voices. Transparent eyelids. I don't know what that is. Transparent eyelids? Artificial tinnitus ringing in your ears. All this stuff. They're bragging about how they can do this. They call it the psychoelectronic weapon effects. And they got a little footnote down there. It said, the first unclassified successful transmission of the human voice directly into the skull of a living person was performed by Dr. Joseph Sharp of the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in 1974. Well, that's the first unclassified successful thing. Now, they've had classified stuff before that. And as I pointed out before... Kind of my last words. Um, it's really unfortunate that I have to make this video. You see, I am a victim of covert harassment. 
uh, and electronic harassment and gang stalking. Uh, I'm what's called a targeted individual. On November 20th, 2014, 31-year-old Myron May walks into Strozier Library on the campus of Florida State University and opens fire. Three people are injured. May tries to leave campus and a shootout with police in front of the library ends violently. The medical examiner confirming May was shot 24 times by police. For now, things seem to be back to normal on campus. Students have fallen back into their routines, but it was here not so long ago on a tragic night that has many wondering what could make a man snap and lose control. What causes a seemingly well-liked guy to plan a mass murder? Is it mental illness, or as many suggests, being a victim of gang stalking? Uh, the goal of gang stalking is literally uh, to drive a targeted individual crazy. If you search gang stalking on the internet, you can find thousands of people all over the world describing similar circumstances. Those who feel they are victims of gang stalking truly believe people are out to get them. They employ isolation tactics. Um, they basically try to convince your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, uh, that they should be keeping an eye on you. In a two hour video diary that May released before the shooting, he explains how and when he started to believe he was a targeted individual. A constant bout of noise that is never ending is designed to keep the targeted individual on edge. In September of 2014, while May was living in Las Cruces, New Mexico, he filed a police report. In the incident report, May told police that someone put a camera in his apartment and that he was hearing voices coming through the walls. May began to believe family and friends were in on the conspiracy to make him crazy. I am totally not crazy. I'm, I'm completely sane, but they've employed these tactics against me as well to try to make me appear uh, to be a crazy person. Tyrone Dew, an advocate and victim of gang stalking, says it's hard to prove that gang stalking is not just in your mind. It's virtually impossible to be able to tell that someone is being attacked because we cannot see these weapons that are being used against you. We can only see the direct effects and these effects, you know, really seem like symptoms. And what unfolded that Thursday morning in November is testimony of just how bad those suffering from mental illness can get. Through the entire process, Myron May believed he was being stalked. There has been a shooting in the library. Stay where you are. Father, forgive me for what I'm about to do. Forgive me for all of my sins, past sins, present sins, any future sins. I'm sorry that my faith was so weak. Amen. Now consider what you just heard. When you start to plug something like 5G into the equation, you begin to get a clearer picture. Could these waves and emissions somehow covertly instigate or exacerbate voice-to-skull type technology? Let's even go one step further. Can it be used to incite feelings of hostility or perhaps generally alter consciousness? Take a listen at what I've had to say within this context before. You don't have to completely understand the ins and outs of 5G to pull some connections. This is where 5G comes in. It's military-grade technology which operates using millimeter waves, a type of radio wave, and it's the next milestone of the Long-Term Evolution Network, or LTE. The standardization of 5G roughly began in 2011 with the initial inception of 4G and is expected to attain commercial momentum circa 2020. According to Verizon, states like California and Florida are going to be preliminary staging grounds. But if you've been following fifth generation news, then you know integral components are already in place, such as beam forming, small cells, and massive input, massive output, or MIMO for short. Try to understand, fifth gen is more than expanding bandwidth real estate and spectrum space. Sure, they need appropriate fluidity to ensure telecommunications traffic and data transfers, but its infrastructure suggests this technology is possibly accompanied by additional applications. Wireless frequencies can be configured to achieve a wide range of effects, including altering the conscious mind of a mammalian species. Just one of the examples demonstrating this is MKUltra, a declassified project in hearing, courtesy of the U.S. government and affiliates, where in one of the experiments, a monkey was put to sleep with radar. The implications will become clear shortly. Unsurprisingly, current data transfer techniques are already known to adversely affect those with frequency sensitivities. This means the questionable, possibly carcinogenic radiation and frequency bombardment is inclined to grow under 5G's commercial rollout, as well as the potential for shifting the cognition of the public. And let's just be clear here, that's mind control. 
while we're on the topic, the weaponizing and directing of this energy might offer alternatives to the uncharacteristic behavior some individuals undergo prior to shootings or other violent instances which are normally attributed to drugs or psychosis. See what I mean by implications? Now, if you've been following me somewhat closely, not long ago I released an episode showing that researchers developed a frequency and audible to the human ear which can send commands to smart devices and personal digital assistants like Google Home and Amazon's Alexa. I'll play a bit of that now. Many people have grown accustomed to talking to their smart devices, asking them to read a text, play a song, or set an alarm. But someone else might be secretly talking to them too. Over the last two years, researchers in China and the United States have begun demonstrating that they can send hidden commands that are undetectable to human ears to Apple's Siri, Amazon Alexa, and Google's Assistant. Inside university labs, the researchers have been able to secretly activate the artificial intelligence systems on smartphones and smart speakers, making them dial phone numbers or open websites. In the wrong hands, the technology could be used to unlock doors, wire money, or buy stuff online, simply with music playing over the radio. I mean, right there, those are some pretty heavy implications. They've designed this frequency, undetectable to human hearing, that can activate your wireless assistant. But if you're somebody who has a digital wallet, sensitive information hooked up to a smart device, or an account linked to one of these smart speakers, you're likely at the most risk. But the article goes on to say, a group of students from University of California, Berkeley, and Georgetown University showed in 2016 that they could hide commands in white noise played over loudspeakers and through YouTube videos to get smart devices to turn on airplane mode or open a website. This month, some of those Berkeley researchers published a research paper that went further saying they could embed commands directly into recordings of music or spoken text. So while a human listener hears someone talking or an orchestra playing, Amazon Echo speaker might hear an instruction to add something to your shopping list. Interesting, right? So finally, let me circle back to the beginning. There is no better way, in my humble opinion, than to tackle this kind of information with prudency in lieu of paranoia. Logic instead of lunacy, and of course, the Most High and His only begotten Son, Yeshua. Right? Because no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Take care out there.